This is my history interview with uh, Bud Mingledorf. Um, and uh, what started this was I found this mm -hmm. uh, in my archives that okay. somebody had collected right. over the years. Mm -hmm. And this story is so great. Um, I'm going to read a little bit of it, yeah, okay? okay? In 1939, a Savannah businessman, Joe Boudreau, mm -hmm. contacted the Carrier Co Air Conditioning Corporation of Syracuse, New York, about air conditioning his new home he was building on Abercorn Street in Savannah. Air conditioning homes were rare in those days, so Carrier sent an engineer to Savannah to see Mr. Boudreau and look over his house plans. Mr. Boudreau asked his son-in-law, Lee Mangledorf, a recent graduate from Georgia Tech to sit in on the meeting, and Lee became the carrier rep for Mingle, for, for uh, uh, the Georgia area. I think that's pretty cool. Yeah. Uh -huh. Now this thing says the house is still there. I tried right. to look it up. Is it still there? Oh, yeah. Okay, I tried to look it up on the on the internet. Mm -hmm. um, th there wasn't any information on it, but that's okay. that's uh, that's pretty neat. I'll have to go and visit it when yeah, I yeah, you have to go go see it. It's it's one of those. It's, it's Today, it's considered to be in uh, part of the historic area of Savannah, but it was like Buckhead in the 1930s. It was a, it was a suburb. It was a, a subdivision. Ansley, uh, uh, kind of like Ansley Park here, was, uh, was built during, um, really right after the Depression, mm -hmm. and was the first golf course development thing. Well, Archley Park is what this place is called in Savannah, and it's just south of Victory Drive. Uh, Victory Drive was the outer boundary of Savannah. That's the road that goes out to Savannah Beach that has the, uh, like the palm trees that align, that goes out to Tybee Island, and it's really uh, the dead end of Highway 80. And in the old days, when I was a kid, and Savannah's claim to fame was that Highway 80 ends in Los Angeles. And uh, you could drive literally from Savannah to Los Angeles. Another Route 66, yeah, huh? Yeah, another Route 66, except they didn't, they didn't make a television show out of it. <laughs> uh, but um, at one point in time, that Palm Drive, which begins just west of, on the western edge of Savannah and goes all the way to Savannah Beach, was considered to be the longest Palm Drive in the, uh, in the country. Uh, longer than the stuff in Florida, even though it's palmetto palms, which the people in Florida would contest is not really a palm tree, but it is. Uh, so uh, the house was uh, was being built then, and a little background on Joe Budrow. He was, of course, my grandfather on my mother's side, since it was his son-in-law, obviously. But um, Joe Budrow was a Canadian illegal immigrant. He came down across the border hoboed his way south. Um, no money. His family owned a potato farm in Canada, um, uh, in Montreal. He was French-Canadian, spoke English with a French accent, wore one of these round uh, uh, derby hat, uh, whatever you call it, thing that... Uh, uh, yeah, derbies. Uh, yeah, he was, uh, he was a character of, uh, of, of some repute himself, and... Uh, as he came south, he made an interesting discovery that the principal starch in the south was rice. And he didn't eat a lot of potatoes. Well, as a potato farmer, having grown up on a potato farm, he took personal offense to the <laughs> fact that they didn't eat potatoes in the south. And um, decided there was an opportunity to potentially sell potatoes uh, to restaurants. Uh, in particular, Irish potatoes. Now, later they learned how to market Idaho potatoes as a brand name, kind of like you would have uh, Vidalia onions. Mm -hmm. Well, at the time, nobody ever heard of an Idaho potato. Uh, so he actually went, believe it or not, to upscale restaurants and taught them into offering potatoes as a uh, uh, accessory item uh, to the menu, and they did not. Really work. They didn't offer potatoes. Wow, did it? Yeah. And they, and in particular, sell Irish potatoes, and uh, put down that, that we 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 offer the finest Irish potatoes. And I would defy you to taste the difference between one potato and another. Yeah. Um, but at any rate, it worked. And I guess at the end of the day, everybody's looking for some marketing statement you could make about your restaurant and whatever. 
they have restaurants advertising that they that they that they had Irish potatoes on their menu. That's and cool. Joe what Bucrow, a neat story. Yeah. He actually became the world's largest potato broker, probably the only potato broker. Uh, he would buy potatoes from New England, put them on ships, and bring them to the port in Savannah. And then they would ship them as far west as Texas, out of Savannah. And it was a J.L. Budrow, um, uh, what was it? That, it was J.L. Budrow Company, but it had some uh, slogan underneath it that uh, related to, basically he was a food broker, but he only sold potatoes. And he actually created potato market that was so large that uh, a bunch of farmers got into it in New England. Mm -hmm. And what happens, of course, in the world of agriculture is that uh, when it becomes a parade, it's time to get out. Um, they switch from other crops and switch to potatoes, and then you had a glut of potatoes. Okay. And uh, uh, the government, of course, then stepped in as the government does, they're going to have price control potatoes. So they, they put in a program where they would buy all the excess potatoes in order to support the potato pricing. In other words, instead of just subsidizing potato prices, the government uh, in the 1920s uh, decided to buy all of the surplus potatoes. We so, never learned, do we? No. Mm -hmm. So they would buy the potatoes, and guess who they bought the potatoes from? Joe Budrow. And uh, uh, my grandfather had this neat technique. When the ship would arrive in Savannah, they sorted the potatoes. Uh, because the potatoes, believe it or not, in the, in the 1920s, they didn't understand um, quality control. Quality control was on the back end, not the front end. If you think about it, they were shipping from New England rotten potatoes. They would buy the potatoes in bulk from the farmer. Uh, and they had um, uh, these potato uh, warehouses and stuff all around New England where those were separate independent companies that were then selling the potatoes to, to, to Joe Budrow Company. So um, what they did was they would then, whatever potatoes they bought, they would be graded by size and by weight, and then they would put them on ships and send them to Savannah. They would then sort the rotten potatoes and the bad yeah. potatoes and the bruised potatoes in Savannah. Well, but that's no good. Yeah, after they had already been hauled all the way yeah. from New England. So they're hauling bad product, in essence, all the way to Savannah. So they would sort all the potatoes in Savannah. Well, here's the J.L. Budrow Company with this huge contract with the government to buy massive amounts of potatoes. So they, they got the rotten so they potatoes. They stopped doing the, t yeah, okay. They sorted all the rotten potatoes <laughs> into barges, and then they would haul the barges by tug by sea tugs out into the Atlantic Ocean and dump the They're barges. Kidding. The government so actually... They used it for fertilizer or something. Oh, no, they yeah. dumped them in the, in the ocean. They had actually built special barges that would dump the potatoes uh, into the ocean. Uh, so God, instead of taking them and you know, like Bruce says, just throw them out on fields and plow them, plow them oh, under as fertilizer, uh -uh, they don't want to do that. That, that would deflate the, I guess, the fertilizer market. So Joe Budrow made a gazillion dollars um, uh, marketing potatoes mm -hmm. uh, to the government and to uh, fine restaurants and ultimately the grocery stores and so stuff you got, like you're that. Named. Yeah, I'm named for, for him. Yeah. And um, my my name is Lindley Budrow, and his name was Joseph Lindley Budrow. Okay. So they, she dropped a Joe part. A lot of people called him Bud, as opposed to Joe, because everybody was Joe, so he just nicknamed him Bud. But uh, uh, he became one of the wealthiest men in Savannah at the time. Uh, and he was going to build his dream house during the Depression. Really, that's 1939, that's yeah. yeah. Uh, this house was designed, conceived of in 1936, and the Depression was still going. Uh, the Depression really ended as a result of World War II. Mm -hmm. But Joe Budrow was making a lot of money coming through the Depression uh, because he was selling all of his potatoes to the government. And the government was price supporting the potato market, uh, which only encouraged more people to get into the potato market, which then encouraged the government to spend more money and buy more potatoes from Joe Budrow. So the more potatoes the government bought, the more the farmers planted. 
because they were still making a lot of money on potatoes. And it was only later that the government ever figured out that what we need to do is pay farmers not to plant. Yeah. And that's when they started this other harebrained idea is we'll lease the is land that a from... statement, but yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, you, know, uh, you, you see it happen today in South Georgia, they take some of the most barren land, the land that only grows scrub oak, mm -hmm. and that's what you lease to the government. Mm -hmm. Then you go buy the latest and greatest in high-grade fertilizers, and you take the money that you have made leasing farrowed land, mm -hmm. uh, you know, barren land to the government, you take that money and buy an irrigation system. Mm -hmm. And you put in an irrigation system, you use the latest in, in hybrid seeds and fertilizers, and you double the production of the fields you are planting, and you use the money the government paid you not to plant, and yeah. your actual production goes up. Yeah, which is uh, not so what they were trying to do. Which is not what they're trying to do. <laughs> you can beat any system that does not, That's other than the, the, yeah. Yes. Yeah, the, the forces of the marketplace can always be beaten when you create this artificial uh, thing. So, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. But basically, Me too. I, I don't believe that the government ever does anything really right. Uh, and uh, doing stuff it shouldn't be doing. Yeah. Joe Budrow rode that that wave while it lasted, uh, and. It was a good program in the government's mind because they went to one, one broker and bought up the supply, which then kept the supply from hitting the market, kept the prices up, and it was, you know, we use the term in wholesale business, you rifle shoot into a market such as the apartment market. You go in and you plant load uh, with a few big apartment jobs because you can go out and you can take an 800 unit apartment job and put 800 units down an assembly line, but not erode your pricing into mm. other areas. Uh, the pricing doesn't leach out of that one project over into another and another. And um, uh, so the government was doing the same thing. You go buy all the potatoes from Joe Budrow, and that program, by doing that, and, and if we ditch the potatoes in the ocean, then we have cured the problem except that it just continued to encourage more farmers to get into the business, which cr created more political pressure to keep the price up. So Joe Budrow designs, or uh, has designed, this great house. Problem was, Joe Budrow was a Canadian, and he's living in Savannah, and it is absolutely tropical. I mean, the, the letters from the early colonists back to, to England are just dreadful as they describe this inhumane place. Yellow fever, all kinds oh, of stuff. Oh, they had all kinds of stuff. And uh, Joe Budrow uh, loved the South for a lot of different reasons, but one thing he absolutely could not abide was the, the temperature and the humidity. And he reads about air conditioning, and uh, legend has it in Popular Mechanics. Uh, and they have an article in there uh, about uh, air conditioning, and uh, Willis Carrier had been at it really since, I guess, 1912, I guess, was when he put in the first unit. I think that that's, uh, no, they just celebrated the, di the yeah, 19th anniversary. Yeah, 2000, 1904, I guess. Yeah. So air conditioning been around for about 30 years, but um, slow go. You know, it's mm -hmm. like electricity uh, was around in the 1870s, but it was never mass produced until the early 1900s. Well, same thing with air conditioning equipment. It was uh, just getting traction. And he read about it, wrote a letter to the county air conditioning company and asked them if they would be interested in air conditioning his house. And he, they said that they would if it was big enough, uh, that they really didn't <laughs> do a lot of houses well, this particular house was big enough for their smallest unit. And um, they wrote him a letter back and said they would be interested in doing a house, and they would send an engineer from Syracuse to Savannah to meet with him uh, to do the proposal. Well, Joe Budrow was a salesman, and he was counting on a super salesman coming out of Syracuse. Uh, selling a mechanical device. Now the other thing you need to know about Joe Budrow, he only had a fifth grade education. 
So um, he invited his new son-in-law uh, that had graduated from Georgia Tech. Um, my father was a freshman at Georgia Tech at 16 and was graduated at 20. Really? So, wow. yeah, he was, uh, uh, but you know, in those days, I guess the life expectancy was in the f about 45 or 48, something like that. You had to go ahead and graduate. Yeah, you had to, you, you had to get on with life. Yeah. And you had know? to be foreshortened. Yeah, yeah so, uh, but he was, uh, um, um, he was a, what you would call an early achiever. So, um, uh, he had married Joe Budrow's only daughter and had taken her off to live in Indianapolis. And he had a job working for the Caterpillar Diesel Engine Company in Indianapolis. Uh, that was his first job out of Georgia Tech. And um, uh, so at 24 years old, he came back to Savannah to meet with his carry engineer. And they met in Morrison's cafeteria in Savannah over lunch. Um, and uh, the carrier guy laid out his proposal and before the meeting was over, the carry guy not only sold Joe Budrow that house, but he sold my father the franchise mm -hmm. to be the carrier contractor from Savannah to Augusta to Tallahassee. So we had the entire lower half of the state uh, from Augusta south of Macon. We cut a path south of Macon over kind of a semicircle mm -hmm. south of Macon. So that brought your dad back to Georgia? Brought him back to Georgia in Savannah, and Joe Budrow, of course, loaned him the money mm. to buy the franchise. It wasn't like a lot of money, but it was the Depression, mm. and um, uh, this was in 1939, uh, February 1939 to be exact. So they, um, um, he comes back to Savannah uh, immediately, you know, turns in his resignation, comes back to Savannah. Uh, the carrier people train him on the installation of that job, and um, they, the timing it was literally uh, the framing of the house was, was happening. I mean, the time to make the decision and go with this thing was right now. Mm -hmm. So they brought him back immediately, and he starts installing his first job under carrier's tutelage. Now, carrier was actually in the contracting mm -hmm. business but getting out. They were going into the mass production of air conditioning equipment. Willis Carey was still alive. He didn't die until the 1950s. So, but they had converted from the Carey Engineering Company to the Carey Air Conditioning Company, and they were going to uh, uh, design more air conditioning systems and, and build a volume up and stuff like that. So at any rate, they were franchising installers and exiting the install, inst installation business. And uh, so he, he comes back to Savannah, and um, um, the first job he does is his own father-in-law's house. Then he does a couple of movie theaters and a bank, uh, and because you, you did all these big stores, and then ultimately uh, there's, a, there's an, um, an ad we have, which is really from the 1950s, early 1950s where Mingleboss actually did the installation on the DeSoto Hotel. That got them a lot of the publicity that they wanted because a lot of the, the uh, everything for the debutante parties to the weddings and everything were all done at the DeSoto. And I can remember as a kid that, uh, that we used to have a tent at the fair with a big sign out front, come in and feel air conditioning. Oh, and we had, to, we had to convince people that they needed air conditioning. Yeah. You don't have to do that today, but that was the big deal, was that uh, this is a nice thing to have. And um, uh, I've never actually seen the data on it, but I understand from my father that one of the other battles they had in the 1940s was that uh, there was a belief that air conditioning was detrimental to your health that the, the temperature and humidity changes going in and out of, of air-conditioned environments okay. would give you colds and make you susceptible to um, uh, breathing issues and things like that. And there was actually a study commissioned by a grant given to the University of Alabama to study the effects of, of air conditioning on, on the, uh, on, the, on the health and well-being, and of course the argument the air conditioning industry had at the time was, you know, if you live in New England and you go from, from zero to 65, 
I mean, that's 65 degree temperature change like yeah. that. I mean, we're talking about 20 degree temperature changes. But it was the same crowd that believed that you couldn't move faster than a horse could run. It was that same psychology that was there. Uh, and then the country had just come through the block electricity movement. Uh, there was a big deal. They used to have protests on the street in, New, in streets of New York protesting the electrification of houses. And they would actually catch stray dogs and electrocute them on stage. That's what we're trying uh, to say it was dangerous. It was, no. it was dangerous. And if they had invented the electric chair before they invented the light bulb, we probably wouldn't have light bulbs. Uh, because there was a big movement that was absolutely convinced that electricity was dangerous. Too dangerous to have in an environment with children and stuff like that. So they would electrocute dogs to prove how dangerous this stuff was and uh, uh, scare the tar out of people yeah. with the thing. But that was the same crowd that was uh, uh, going after the air conditioning business. Bad science. Mm -hmm. But that was what they were doing. So anyway, in that environment, we, we crank up mingle dolls. Um, and, but it only lasted about two years. The thing about 1939, 1939, February 1939 was only, what, seven months ahead of the invasion of Poland. Okay. Um, and what happened was when a father came back to Savannah in February, uh, he and his father got together. My, my grandfather, Mingledorf, owned a little machine shop called the Forest City Machine Shop. Uh, Eighteen people. Um, second, third generation machine shop. I, my, the Mingledoffs immigrated from Germany in 1734. Uh, there was one Mingledoff that came over with a group of Salzburgers. Uh, and these were Lutheran, um, they were Lutherans from Austria, which were Catholic. And they were being persecuted in, in um, uh, they were from Salzburg, right outside Munich down in, in uh, uh, southern Germany. And uh, so they came over, a whole boatload of them, raised the money, hired a ship, came over, actually landed, or uh, the ship docked in Charleston, and they wouldn't let them off, the ship. Uh, Charleston was British, and they didn't want a bunch of Germans, and they particularly didn't want a bunch of Lutherans. So they, uh, uh, they set sail again and went around, and they, you know, the, uh, the people in Charleston suggested that they go down to Georgia. For, for Savannah, uh, Oglethorpe's cranking up his deal, and Oglethorpe kind of liked the idea as well because he talked to Germans in the settling up the Savannah River in a little area, a high bluff area up there called Ebenezer. And it's still there, the little town of Ebenezer is still there. But all those Germans settled there and became the buffer between the Indians up the Savannah River from the colonies. <laughs> kill them off first. Kill them off no, first. that's yeah. great. And so that was why the Charleston, people in Charleston were actually uh, proud to have Oglethorpe in Savannah because he was now the buffer between the Spaniards in Florida. Uh, that, that to get to Charleston to attack them, you got to come through Savannah. Uh, so word would, would, would get that, you know, that they were marching up out of Florida. So um, uh, we had been principally those Germans that came out of... Uh, of Salzburg. They were principally uh, blacksmiths and um, hardware people. Uh, they were tradesmen uh, as a rule and the Mingledorf that was with them was one of those people and I understand we were in har the hardware business and some things like that. But the branch of the family that I'm from actually was uh, uh, they were they, they had this machine shop located in Savannah so my father and my grandfather mingled off, got together in April of 1939, and they bid on a minesweeper. Now, a minesweeper is a wooden ship uh, that's actually the smallest, quote, ship the Navy has. And uh, they had never built a minesweeper, but as a machine shop, uh, one thing they knew, you could follow directions. There was actually more creativity in the air conditioning business than there was in the shipbuilding business. I mean, you had a set of plans, and if you didn't design the ship, there wasn't any creativity to it. I mean, you simply...